So my good friend Simon Harper sent me a link on Twitter or X earlier on today to this article about WordPress and what should be on its roadmap from Juice DeValk, the guy, one of the guys behind Yoast SEO. And it's an interesting read. It also links to another post from Hendrik Lewison, which I hope I didn't butcher the name too badly there, which is WordPress isn't WordPress anymore. I would link these in the description below. I recommend reading them for yourself. But I wanted to go over some of the points raised in both of these articles because I think it's interesting when we take a look at WordPress, where it is, where it's going, and where it's been for the last couple of years. So that's what I'll kind of talk about. But before I even start on this, once you've watched this video or you've read the articles, please do let me have your comments, feedback, and thoughts down below. Do you agree with any of the points? Disagree with any of the points? What are your experiences? What are your findings? Let me know because I'd love to hear your thoughts on this whole topic. Okay, so basically, let's start off with the article here from uh, with regards to WordPress and the roadmap. This is posted today, so this is a fresh article. Nothing to do with drama or anything else. They have a park in that and ignoring that completely. But looking at WordPress's market share, let's start off with that. If we take a look at the figures here, and this goes from the beginning of 2018 through to November of this year. So it's, it's up to date over a, a decent period of time. You can definitely see that it's on the upward trend until the beginning of 2023, where basically WordPress has kind of sat stagnant with little ebbs and flows like you would expect with any kind of platform. But it's sitting there relatively stagnant. So there's not really any growth coming into WordPress, which is kind of a sad thing to see. But if we take a look at some of its peers, for example, in Magento, Drupal, Joomla, and PrestaShop, all sort of like self-hosted platforms, you'll see that they're actually on a downward trajectory anyway. So Open source, well, you know, if you're inside that world, you may think it is the most important thing in the world. Chances are most people don't care. You know, I've never had a client that's come to me in the years that I've been building websites, whether that was my own or working with WordPress, that have ever said to be poor. I really want the website you build me to be on an open source platform because I think the ethos behind it is something I want to celebrate and support. Not once have I ever had that. But if you have, let me know in the comment section down below. Because again, I would love to know if you've had that conversation with clients, potential clients, and it's been an influencing factor on them actually working with you. Let me know in the comments. So as you can see, WordPress is sitting relatively stagnant for the last couple of years, and its kind of peers are definitely on a bit of a downward trajectory. However, if we take a look in comparison to some SaaS tools, so that's a software as a service, these are not self-hosted, not open source, for example, Webflow, Squarespace, Wix, and Shopify, they are all on a considerable uptrend. They are increasing in usage and popularity. So I think that definitely suggests that when it comes to open source, people don't really care. They just don't care as much as you or I may think they do. So, you know, the whole argument for open source and all those kinds of things go with it and how that's more important and you own your data and all those kinds of things is obviously not a massive consideration for the majority of people out there building websites that are part of this whole raw statistical research. It's interesting to kind of get that kind of feedback. And then you have to look at another thing the article kind of brings up that where WordPress has grown over the last several years, would that be the same if it wasn't for platforms like Elementor or WooCommerce? I mean, like it or loathe it, Elementor does have a massive user base. That's the free and the pro premium version. WooCommerce is a very popular platform for e-commerce, especially if you want to do it on a budget. Without those, would we be seeing the stagnation or would we be seeing more of a downward trend in WordPress in favor of these SaaS platforms? I think it's interesting to sort of think about that and ponder that for a moment. If they're on the rise and WordPress is stagnant, you have to ask yourself why. So there's a couple of points then that are kind of brought up with regards to why is this happening? Well, people's perception of WordPress is maybe justified, maybe not justified. So people consider this as being old and not modern, it's insecure, it's slow, all these kinds of things. So let's address a couple of these things first of all and give my opinions and my takes on why may people may think that and if there's any merit in those particular thoughts. So WordPress is slow and technically stagnant. Well, from a slow point of view, I don't think that's particularly true. If we take WordPress core, and we're talking only about WordPress core, we're not putting plugins and themes and things on top of it, just the native WordPress itself. They've got a team behind this that are focused and dedicated to improving the code base and speeding up and making WordPress a faster platform at its core. And I can't say they're doing a bad job with that at all. However, technically stagnant, I would say, yes, that there's, there's some real truth in that. Because if you consider 
for the last six to eight years, the only area in WordPress that has been changed, enhanced, and added to in any significant way is the block editor, or Gutenberg as it, as it was and kind of technically still is called, and full site editing. These are two areas that not as many people as they might assume care. You know, when you've got, let's just like 19 million websites using Elementor, then take a look at the percentages that are using full site editing and full site editing themes and so on. There's a massive disparity between the two of those. And you have to ask yourself, why? Why are people not adopting full site editing or why are they not adopting the block editor at the same rate as tools like Elementor or page builders or just kind of builders in general? You have to ask yourself, why is that the case? Let's move on to the next kind of point, which is WordPress is insecure. Again, let's talk about WordPress core here. WordPress core itself, sure, there's always going to be security and potential security issues in any kind of code base, no matter what it is. It doesn't matter whether it's self-hosted or it's part of a SaaS platform. There's still the potential to have insecurities in there that can be exploited. So from that point of view, I don't think WordPress is any better or any worse than most other platforms out there. The problem arises when we start to add in plugins and themes and third-party sort of tools and features that add on to WordPress. That's where you have a lot more individuals and companies that are all coding in technically slightly different ways and all bolting these pieces on top of WordPress. That's where the potential comes in. Also, I think the fact that you now have these bug bounties that are being sort of pushed forward to get more and more people to find and identify and report bugs and security issues in themes and plugins and WordPress core itself will raise the awareness of how many of those are actually out there in the wild. You also have to ask yourself when you take a look, for example, at WordPress.org, the repository, how many plugins there are. So like 50, 60,000 plugins. How many of those are updated, maintained, and actively supported as well as well-coded? These are all things that make the platform a blessing because you have so many options available to do almost anything and a curse because you have no control over things. Plus, you don't know without easily finding out, is this still being supported? Is it still being updated? Are the security patches being added to it? There's all manner of different things out there that cause a problem. Now, for example, recently Patchstack held a special event in their bug bounty program for Cybersecurity Month, and they closed 1,000 plugins on WordPress.org as a result. 1,000 plugins. Now imagine how many more are out there that are not closed. And this, like I say, is a little bit of a concern. If we take a look further down, the plugin repository or directory talks about 59,000 plugins, whereas the XML sitemap for the plugin directory says about 14,500 plugins. Big disparity there. Which are we talking about? Are we talking about 59,000 plugins are available, but 14,500 of them are actively supported and so on? You know, we, we, need, we need some way of being able to vet these and push out ones that are no longer supported. It would be nice to have some kind of automated system if no update was released for a certain period of time. It gets marked as so, and then you can, you know, choose whether you want to use it or not. Then we've got WordPress is too hard to use. Oh, this is one of those things that, uh, yeah, is kind of frustrating because if you are someone coming from using a page builder, for example, like Element or, or Bricks or something like that, there's a consistency across how they work. The once you go into the, the sort of the builder, into the settings, all those kind of things, is consistency across all those different aspects of that builder. Yet when you go into full site editing, it's different to Gutenberg, the block editor. It's different to WordPress, the standard WordPress dashboard and so on. And it's been like that for a long time. I've talked about this in multiple different live streams and videos in the past. It's not a good experience. This is where UI and UX is really rubbish when it comes to WordPress. And if we take a look at this chart, for example, We've got Elementor. Look at the rise of that Elementor in comparison to the WordPress editor, the blue line. Gives you some idea. And then the WordPress block editor. It gives you some idea of the adoption rate and the people that are interested in this. So it's saying the block editor was released in December the 6th, 2018. 2018. That's crazy. Wasn't tracked in this data until earlier this year. And then the drop in Elementor's growth is a result of measurement change. So they kind of correlate with each other. Yeah. 
it's kind of kind of crazy to sort of think of this. And this kind of goes on as a few more bits and pieces inside you, which I would recommend, like I say, taking a look at the article. But the other thing I want to sort of talk about is the article that's referenced to you from Hendrik, which is WordPress isn't WordPress anymore. And the kind of crux of this article is looking at how WordPress is put together. And I can't help but agree with a lot of what's being said here, which is it would be so much better if WordPress was left as it was as a core product. So think of WordPress before Gutenberg, before full site editing. We don't really see a much difference apart from those aspects. So the core of it is still the same. It would have made so much more sense to have full site editing and or the block editor to be plugins. And the concept of this is that you keep the core of WordPress lean like it used to be. So it has the ability to API into various different parts of it. You can expand it through a, a plugin and take out some of the crap that we don't need in there. So like this talk about in here are things like slider elements and things like the duo tone and stuff like that, which to be honest, what's the point? Most of that stuff is just kind of like superfluous junk that's stuck on top that no one really gives a shit about. Whereas some of the core fundamental things are still being missed out. Whereas if, let's just say Gutenberg, full site editing, block editor, blah, 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 was separate and plugins, you could plug in as you want. Then you've got the people that, like myself, that use bricks, people that use Elementor, people that use other page builders that sit on top of WordPress, don't have all that crap there that they don't want to even use or have to deal with taking up part of core. So this is all code that needs to be maintained. And the argument here is that for every new feature you add into core WordPress, that's another feature that has to be maintained, checked, updated, managed, and so on. And I agree with that in part. I still think if you listen to this, there's certain things inside you that I don't agree with. I do still think that things like custom post types, custom meta fields and so on should be part of core. And then the sort of the more sort of esoteric design aspects of it should be separate to it because you can pick and choose what you do and don't want to use. Whereas if you want to use your WordPress as a CMS, a content management system, you have those options available. If you don't, you want to use it as a blog, well, you just don't use those, but you don't need to have all those other design orientated junk and full site editing junk chucked into this to the mix for you. Because I can imagine the majority of people that are using this, especially if you want to create a blog or a simple website and so on, don't want to have to deal with full site editing. They want to simply take a theme that they like, free or paid, plug that into WordPress and start adding content. They don't want to go into the full site editor, which looks completely different to the block editor, which looks completely different to the WordPress dashboard and all those kinds of things. I agree. I do agree. I just don't agree with everything that they're saying there that everything that should or shouldn't be included or excluded. I still think there's a case for certain things that should be part of core and then take the design aspects of it, like the block editor out. And the final thing I want to touch upon that's covered in one of these articles, I can't remember which one it is, is who makes the decisions about what gets included and what doesn't? Because right now, when you can consider it, the number of people that originally and pretty still do want full site editing and so on to be incorporated directly into you know, WordPress itself, into the core WordPress, is probably a tiny fraction of the people that actually use WordPress. And as we've already seen, the uptake of full site editing and also the block editor in comparison to tools like Elementor is minuscule. And I think that's indicative of how people use WordPress. Who makes the decisions? Because whoever's making them is pushing head first, regardless of what their user base actually wants. And if they're trying to compete with the likes of Wix and Squarespace, with the fact that they're on the upward trend and WordPress is on a stagnant trend for the last two plus years, surely that should say to somebody in power, this is not working. We need to rethink, reevaluate, and reassess how we move forward. Or we're going to risk it to the point where we start to drop off in comparison to these other platforms and we lose market share considerably. With the drama that's going on right now, I think we will probably see once those dates and get updated a little bit more over the next couple of months, I think we will see a downward trend to a certain extent. Will it be massive? Probably not, unless this drama keeps on going. But like I said, that's for a different conversation. I've talked about this in the past. But those are the two articles. There's some of the points that I want to draw your attention to. 
Let me have your thoughts and your feedback in the comment section down below. But as always, this is a conversation. All links are in the description down below. My name is Paul C. This is WP Tuts. And until next time, take care.